The head of Hamas in Gaza has a master plan, and Israel's military response is a big part of it. If October 7th had not provoked this reaction, they would have tried again and again and again. Are the people of Gaza just his pawns? Gaza can be destroyed, half destroyed. He's a marked man accused of using children as human shields. Experts say Yahya Sinwar is himself an expert on Israel and its politics. Terence McKenna on how he's used that knowledge to advance his schemes. A key moment leading up to the present Gaza crisis came in 2011 when in exchange for a single Israeli soldier kidnapped by Hamas, the Israelis released over 1,000 prisoners from their jails, none more famous than Yahya Sinwar. He had been incarcerated for 22 years after being sentenced to four consecutive life terms for murder. He was given a hero's welcome in Gaza and was quickly reintegrated into the Hamas leadership. In 2017, he was appointed to replace the outgoing Hamas leader in Gaza, Ishmael Haniya, and he was reappointed to that post in 2021. He never made a secret of his elaborate plans to have thousands of Hamas fighters attack Israel, which he called the Jewish entity. <laughs> True to his word, the October 7th attack was codenamed Al-Aqsa Flood. It was just as murderous as he planned it. Ehud Yari has been a television journalist and author in Israel for over 50 years. He wrote the first biography of Yasser Arafat. He regularly visited prominent Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. He interviewed Yahya Sinwar four times. He was always, wherever he was sent, he became in no time the leader of all the prisoners, whether they Hamas or Fatah or any other organization. Because of his domineering uh, personality, and his ruthlessness. People became either fans of him of his or were too afraid of him. Hussein Ibish is senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. He says Sinwar wanted the massive Israeli counterattack that has killed thousands of Palestinian civilians. They have said not only do they want a permanent state of war with Israel, but if October 7 had not provoked this reaction, they would have tried again and again and again until they got this reaction. Because the ultimate aim is to lure Israel back into the Gaza Strip in a permanent way uh, and to attack the Israelis in an insurgency that goes on day in and day out. So they can say to the other Palestinians and the Arab world, we are the national movement. We are fighting occupation forces every day. It was very clear that the state of Israel should be destroyed and the Jews cannot be a part of a, a Palestinian state. Back in the 1980s, Sinwar was an acolyte of Hamas founder Sheikh Yassin, the quadriplegic religious leader. He has said that Yassin charged him with rooting out traitors and collaborators in the Hamas movement. At his 1989 trial in Israel, Sinwar confessed to murdering a suspected collaborator named Ramsey in the graveyard of his Gaza hometown of Khan Yunus. He said, we didn't tell Ramsey what we were going to do. While we interrogated him, we didn't beat him much. I blindfolded him with a rag so he couldn't see. I put him inside a large grave and strangled him with the kafia I had. After strangling him, I wrapped him in a white shroud and closed the grave. I was sure that Ramsey knew he deserved to die. He said that the Palestinian victim knew that he deserved to be choked. The guy is a shrewd, cunning, sophisticated psychopath. I think he's a vicious guy. I think he's one of these people who uh, might have been a gangster in other circumstances, right? Um, he certainly has this 
violent streak, there's no doubt. He thinks in a violent way. During his prison years, Sinwar used the time to learn Hebrew. He said it was to better understand his enemy. Shortly before he was released, he gave an interview in Hebrew to Israeli TV, during which he claimed that he was now prepared to turn the page and work towards a 50-year ceasefire in the region. I think that our that we will support that He knows Israel. He is watching Israeli television. He reads the Israeli press. He knows the nuances between politicians and parties and, uh, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of influences and social media, uh, etc. He considers himself an expert on Israel. In 2021, Sinwar launched a wave of rockets from Gaza to rain down on Israeli civilians. The Israelis responded by bombing the famous Gaza tunnels, and they destroyed Sinwar's house and office with airstrikes. After he negotiated a truce, Sinwar claimed victory and posed for this photo in his destroyed house, a brilliant public relations move that added to his popularity in the Arab world. You know, for him, Gaza can be destroyed, half destroyed. You don't measure it. As long as Hamas bleeding, even humiliated, stands on, on its feet, it's a victory. Is it possible that Sinwar has miscalculated that this war could turn the population of Gaza against Hamas? Hussein Ibish thinks that could happen. It requires Israel to leave Gaza and allow Hamas to crawl out of the rubble and declare divine victory. At that moment, and for the months, the weeks and months after that, it will become hard for Gazans not to have a debate. Like, what happened here? Why did they do that? They knew it was going to happen, and they brought this on us. What did we gain? What have we lost? This is insane. And they are horrendous and get extremely angry with uh, Hamas. On November 4th, the Israeli Defense Minister, Yoav Gallant, announced that his forces had Sinwar surrounded in an underground bunker, unable to communicate with his Hamas troops. Yaya Sinwar has always been conscious of the target on his back, according to Ehud Yari. He always makes a point of being surrounded by children to deter the Israelis from going after him because he's a target, obviously. He knows and he, I think, he accepts it, that he has to run for his life for the rest of his days. I think he understands at the end, the Israelis will get him. It doesn't matter where he is. He could be in the bunker for a year, for two, for three. At one point, the Israelis will get him. I agree with that. I think this is the October 7. The all the authors of October 7 believed they were signing their death warrant. Israel has clearly decided to kill everyone involved in October 7, and uh, I'm pretty sure they'll be able to do that. Yahya Sinwar signed his death warrant. As he has done many times in the past, in October, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu swore vengeance against Hamas leaders, whom he referred to as dead men. He recently called Sinwar a little Hitler. In his deal with the Israeli government, Sinwar settled for a three to one ratio in his trade of civilian hostages. He is expected to be much tougher in negotiations for Israeli military captives, if not at the over 1,000 to 1 ratio that brought about his own release 12 years ago. Yahya yeah, Sinwar may have avoided detection for now and is said to have visited some hostages held by Hamas. Coming up, she's a Canadian soccer legend and a source of inspiration to so many. Even though I might not be on the pitch, I always got it in me to to fight. Christine Sinclair on her retirement and how she hopes her career will be remembered next. A 
legendary career made in the crucial moments. Can Sinclair deliver? Of course you can. Time and again for more than two decades, but now it's coming to an end. There was definitely a part of me that was like, this is it. Global Soccer's all-time leading national team scorer, Christine Sinclair, it's farewell. Ahead of her last two national team games in Vancouver, she shared memories with Andy Petrillo of CBC Sports, starting with Olympic gold in 2021. You know, it's a bittersweet moment, I think, for a lot of fans. But I'm wondering how you're feeling, because here we are at the finish line, and I'm just wondering what kind of emotions are going through you. Honestly, like, I'm good. And I, I always wanted to come to this point and arrive at this point in my career where yeah, I'm okay with the decision I'm making and I've made. And, you know, after Tokyo, yeah, I knew I didn't want to play in Paris, but wanted to give the World Cup one more shot. And then with how the World Cup went, I was like, okay, we need to qualify for Paris. Um, and then it's been kind of perfect to have four kind of send-off games. And I'm good. The team's in great hands. And I'm looking forward to vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Does the body ache a little bit more? Because here's the thing, you are still playing pro. Yeah. You're still in great shape. Yeah. You still have a lot to give. Yeah. Um, so what was the ultimate decision then with the national team? I think I've always wanted to play like a year of pro. Yeah, I look forward to, you know, a year with Portland to obviously compete, try to win, but try to enjoy it. Um, the national team is obviously a very enjoyable place to be but it's also like the highest competitive you know environment you're trying to win world cups and olympic gold medals um i've done all that so i'm good As the, Maple Leaf fills the, air, the cameras the caught you after that final jamaica game the second uh, where you officially qualified for paris and the tears were there and you were being consoled by teammates did you think that was your final game did you think that was it so up until that point, like a decision hadn't been made, but like as that camp went on and even leading into that camp, there was definitely a part of me that was like, this is it. Um, I, I hoped that there would be some sort of send off game. Um, you know, I've seen obviously previous teammates be recognized as they should be. And I was hoping that there would be that opportunity. Um, I didn't know it was going to come you know, this year, um, but yeah, to play a last game in Vancouver, I, yeah, you can't write it any better than that. It is over, brilliant! What a strike from one of the world's... Let's talk about your legacy, because it's a big one, and let's start on the pitch. How do you want people to remember Christine Sinclair, the player? Um, I think just someone that, like, gave their all. Um, yeah, you are going to make me cry, maybe. I'm not trying. <laughs> um, no, just like a someone that, yeah, proud Canadian that gave their all and through good and bad times with the national team, just stuck with it and, yeah, just hope to, yeah, leave the, the game in a better place. Um, and then obviously, hopefully, known to have won a few things as well. Julia Grosso from Vancouver to win it for Canada! Uh, heading into Tokyo, we know the mantra was change the color. You did just that. And oftentimes, you know, when athletes achieve this pinnacle in their career, they reflect. And they reflect on the hard work, what it took to get there. They reflect on people who helped them along the way. Who were you thinking of when you had that gold medal wrapped around your neck? Oh, God, like everyone that helped me get there. Like, oof, teammates that built this program up from scratch that you know, never got that opportunity um, <clears throat> that we were given in Tokyo. Um, definitely my family, um, you know, my little nieces that they just thought it was the coolest thing. Um, and now, you know, dream of representing Canada that, you know, I didn't have that when I was little. Um, so to see the times changing and know that this is just the beginning for this team. It was a year ago that we sat down you were promoting your book. Mm -hmm. And it was really the first time you've also opened up about your parents. Do you think about them a lot? Huh. 
yeah, I mean, they're the best. Um, like supported me the entire way, gave up, sacrificed everything so my brother and I could live the life that we live today. Um, and yeah, it, uh, my dad stuck around to watch Rio. And then my mom you know, got to watch Tokyo before she passed away. So uh, yeah, I owe them a lot and just continuing to try and make them proud. Let's talk about your legacy off the pitch then, because you've also lent your voice for the women's fight, equal pay, equal treatment within the Federation. Um, you've also lent your voice to showing the importance for a domestic, a women's domestic league on Canadian soil. How has the women's game changed when 16-year-old Christine St. Clair stepped on the pitch to 24 years later? <laughs> Holy, um, like I said, like my, I think back to the first World Cup that I played in was the U.S. and we finished fourth. And aside from your like crazy fans, no one cared, no one knew. Um, and to see the game where it is now, like countries that you never would have thought become a world power and now world powers, the the investment that federations are putting into their women's programs, that leagues are putting it into their professional teams. Um, it's exciting. It, when I'm done playing, like I can't wait to just become a fan and watch the game and be in awe of the talent that's out there. Um, unfortunately, I haven't necessarily seen that growth in Canada, um, which as I leave this team scares me a little bit. Do you plan on still being involved when it comes to that fight? Yeah, I mean, even though I might not be on the pitch, I've, I've always got it in me to, to fight, to help grow the game, whether it's domestically in Canada or, or internationally. Um, this game's been my life since I was four, so it's, I'm not just like quitting cold turkey, you know? <laughs> like, I'll, I'll still be around. As her career winds down, Sinclair also got a special tribute from another Canadian icon. Ah, oh. <laughs> my, yeah, I love Rexa. Hi, Christine, it's Ryan Reynolds. I just want to wish A message that took the soccer that. champion by surprise is next in our moment. So here are two Canadian icons you'll probably recognize, but what did Ryan Reynolds say to soccer star Christine Sinclair to get that reaction? Reynolds is the co-owner of Welsh football team Wrexham AFC and is a huge soccer fan. He's also a big fan of fellow Canadian Christine Sinclair. So his surprise tribute to the soccer star is our moment. Oh God, you're making me watch a video. Ah, oh. <laughs> my... It's Ryan Reynolds. I just want to wish you all the best, all the love, and all the luck in retirement. Well, it's not really retirement. Um, in moving on in your career to Wrexham. Uh, it's huge for, for the town, for the club. Uh, I think that you are going to be probably the key difference maker uh, going forward up there in North Wales. Um, Anyway, I wanted to send you lots of love. And I, what I really wanted to do was thank you. I wanted to thank you for inspiring uh, me, my kids, uh, kids all over Canada and the world, uh, young, old, middle-aged. Um, you're incredible. And uh, you deserve all the applause that hands could possibly give. Um, sending you tons of love. Okay, that's super cool. We'll send it to you. Yes, and maybe his phone number. Good, that. Isn't that just the best, the two of them and her reaction? Uh, Christine, you're going to have to get in line, a very long line, I think, of people who would like his phone number. For all of us here at The National, thank you so much for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free app that is the CBC News app, or you can subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Erica Johnson. Take care.